I want to say to our church this morning, never stop. Never stop. I'm thankful for West Florida Baptist Academy. I'm thankful that God has given us that unique position on the front lines of the fight. How many of you parents realize that every day there is a war that is being raged? There's a battle that's being fought for the minds of your children. Man, we know that every day. It's all around us. And God's given this ministry, he's given our church a unique position on the front lines of that fight. And I want to tell our church, never stop, never stop being burdened and passionate about the opportunity that we as a church and ministry have to teach God's truth to right at 750 students. Now that blows my mind. That's, that's incredible. God has been blessing our school and our ministry with incredible growth over the, I think we've doubled in size over the past five or six years. It's just been great to see that. But every single student is a person that gets dropped off at our doorstep, that we get to open up the word of God and we get to teach them the truth of God's word every single day. That is an incredible opportunity and I thank God for it and I praise God for it. And the title of the message that I have for you this morning, this ties in perfectly, is Love Truth. Never stop loving truth. I, that's why I just I want to just drive that point home. As, as a church, as a as a believer, as a parent, as a grandparent, love the truth of God's word. I, I love where we're at at the end of the book of Romans. I've been calling this uh, that last half of chapter 15 and the chapter 16 a manual for healthy ministry. And this morning, I actually thought that we were going to finish the book of Romans. I even told you that last week. We'll have one more message. But then I started digging in, and I came across the four verses that we're going to talk about and we're going to cover today. And I realized that we didn't need to go any further than these four verses because I could not believe how perfectly they fit with a day like today um, where we are just focusing on education and the opportunity that we have to be able to have a Christian school. And uh, this paragraph that we're going to look at today, it fits perfectly because it gives our ministry a warning it gives us a promise, and it gives us a prayer, all right? So we're going to look at, those are our three points today. There's a warning, there is a promise, and there is a prayer. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to Romans chapter 16, and I want us to read out loud verses 17 through 20. You don't have to stand up again. I know we've had you up and down and all around, but I do want you to read out loud with me these four verses, okay? So if you don't have your Bibles, you can look up here on the screen. All right, everybody, starting in verse 17, out loud together, help me out. Here we go. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf." But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Are you all ready to dive right in? That's it for our introduction. We're just going to start right with the warning in verse 17. Look back at that again. He says, now I beseech you, brethren. And then what are the next two words? Mark them. Mark them. It almost feels like this paragraph is out of place that we're looking at right here. It feels that way because Paul's doing an awesome job wrapping up this letter. I mean, Romans 16, like last week, we looked at 27 different names that he mentioned. I mean, and he's, he's closing this up. He greets 26 people at the church at Rome. He says in verse 16, salute one another with a holy kiss. And by the way, I only got one holy kiss on the way out of church last week. I mean, some of you came up and were cracking jokes about that. And I, I did get one on the way out. So, but anyway, he says, salute one another with a holy kiss. All right, you can feel the love. I mean, it's flowing through here. Paul loves the church. Paul loves the family of God. Paul loves people. You can feel that. And then he closes verse 16 and he says one more sentence. He says, the churches of Christ salute you. So, man, love is in the air, and then all of a sudden, everything changes. And he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. I mean, he's back to pleading with them. I'm appealing to you one last time. And then he says, mark them. Those two words that we just looked at. Mark them, which cause division and offenses. He's saying, be vigilant. Be on the lookout. Or you could just translate, mark them. Watch out. All right, so the warning this morning is this. 
Watch out. All right, two real simple words. What is the warning this morning? Y'all are so good. You are a great audience. Watch out. That's the warning. What are we watching out for? We need to watch out for false teachers. False teachers. That's what he says. Mark them, um, which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. He's telling us to watch out for false teachers. Now, some people don't even believe that these verses belong here. Paul hasn't talked about false teachers once in this entire letter. He's talked about a lot of incredible things, but not one time has he even mentioned false teachers up to this point. So why all of a sudden, at the end, when he's wrapping everything up, is he just going to throw this in here real quick? This last final appeal, I think it makes perfect sense. If if you follow along with the flow of the the, the chapter, man, he is... Loving people, okay? And he's greeting them and he's saluting them. And then he's like, so greet one another with a holy kiss. And then he says, the churches of Christ salute you. And I think as soon as he says that, it hits him. I mean, the church at Ephesus, the church at Corinth, the churches at Philippi and Galatia, all of these places that he's been, all of these churches that he has started, the new believers that have gotten saved, guess what has happened at each one of those churches along the way? False teachers have showed up. And I think as soon as he's saying it, the churches of Christ salute you. It also hits him that, oh, no, you guys are in trouble, too. False teachers, they might not be there yet, but they're going to be on their way. Make no mistake about it. There is going to be a battle that is going to be fought for your heart and mind. And just because you've gotten saved and just because you have a good testimony doesn't mean that Satan can't get in and do a whole lot of damage and steer you astray and lead you in a wrong direction. So he's telling them, watch out. Do y'all understand this morning that as, as a Christian, as a believer, that you have a big target on your back? Now, that might not sound like good news, <laughs> and we might not like to hear that, but it, it's the truth. We have a target on our back. The Bible tells us that we are supposed to be sober. We're supposed to be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Jesus illustrates this for us. In Matthew chapter 13, he gave us a parable about the wheat and tares, and he says in Matthew 13, he says, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. You know, what's dangerous about that is while men slept, I mean, that's a normal thing to do. It's not wrong that they were sleeping. Like it gets dark at night and you're supposed to go to bed. Rest is a good thing. And while you're sleeping, while you're doing the most natural, normal thing, the enemy creeps in and he sows tares among the wheat. Now, the problem with tares are they look just like wheat, but they act nothing like wheat. They're poisonous and they can corrupt and contaminate your food, contaminate your food and ruin it and destroy it. And he goes on and he ends up explaining this parable at the end. And he says this, that he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. That's Jesus. So Jesus comes along and he sows the truth of the gospel. And then the field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. That is Christians. If you have believed in Jesus, you are good seed. You are children of the king. You are children of the kingdom. We are supposed to be different. The tares are the children of the wicked one. And the enemy that sowed the tares is the devil. You know what this passage is teaching, and you know what the New Testament reinforces over and over and over again, that wherever God sows his good seed, that's the exact place that the enemy is going to come in and sow his seed as well. We're the front lines of that fight. If the truth of God's word is being taught, if you in your own life are trying to grow and you're soaking up God's word, guess what? He's not going to leave you alone. How many of you understand this from personal experience? You've gotten saved, and man, it's like your whole world just gets turned upside down, and you get on fire. There's like a fire that is lit inside of you, and you're just soaking it all up, and you're just absorbing the truth, but then all of a sudden, it starts getting a little bit hard along the way, doesn't it? And it feels like you just keep getting bombarded from different directions. That's not by mistake. That's not by accident. That's the design of the enemy. He wants to come in and he wants to pull that rug out from under us. And he wants us to buy in to not what the truth is, but into error, into false truth, into doctrines that are contrary to the things that we have been taught. And so he's saying right here, watch out. False teachers are all around you. 
Deception is all around you. By the way, again, we'll just go back to that parent analogy. You understand that false teachers are all around us? You know, as I've been raising kids, I've been shocked at how things change, but this one area just really surprised me. You know, like when we were kids, you turned on the TV and you watched regular old cable, right? You know, our kids don't watch TV. Do you, what do they watch? They watch YouTube. And there's a lot of what on YouTube? There's a lot of influencers on YouTube. And I'm just trying to tell us, all around us are false teachers, people that, that might even creep in unawares. We gotta be on guard. We gotta be paying attention. Watch out for false teachers. This is what he's saying. Now, Here's the second thing I want us to watch out for, and it all goes in the same thing, along the same lines. Not only are we going to watch out for false teachers, but we need to watch out for fair speech. Look at verse 18. He says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by, what are those next two words right there? By good words, and what are the next two words? Fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. By good words and fair speeches. So watch out for fair speech. False teachers seem nice. The division and the fences are going to sound really, really good. I, I could spend a lot of time talking about different things that we could watch out for, but I'm just going to just keep it basic with the truths of God's word this morning, all right? They'll say things like this. I don't really like to talk about sin. Sin's an ugly word. Sin's a nasty word. I'd rather talk about the love of God and about how wonderful you are and about how good of a person you are and how much you are loved by God. Can I tell you, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot to watch out for when you start unpacking that. Hey, they'll come along and they'll say things like, is Jesus really the only way to God? I mean, is he really the only way? I mean, as long as you believe in a power that is bigger and greater than yourself, as long as you're a good person, as long as you do good to others, you genuinely love and you genuinely care and you serve other people, I don't see how a loving God could ever send somebody like that to hell. It's all gonna work out in the end. Just have faith in a higher being and be a, big, a, a good person and you're gonna make it to heaven when it's all said and done. That's false. That's not what God's word teaches, but it sounds nice and it sounds good, right? I mean, they'll come along and they'll say things like, the Bible is a great book, but it's not all literally true. I mean, are we going to believe every single thing that the Old Testament says? And then they'll even try, I mean, people that believe every single thing, like a fish came along and swallowed up a man. I mean, that's just a good story and an allegory. That can't be real. That can't be true. People will come along and they'll start saying things like that. They'll come along and say, Jesus was a great teacher, but he's not really God. He's not God. He, he's the son of God. He was a created being. He's not really God. And you know what they're trying to do? People want to soften the truth. People want to soften Jesus. But the problem is Jesus himself is an offense. He's a stumbling block. How do you think he ended up on the cross? He came to call sinners to repentance. And we cannot soften the truth and we cannot change the truth to make it more palatable to the world that, that wants to receive it because it would do absolutely no good if we don't keep the truth, what God says the truth is in his word. So false teachers seem nice, but they're not serving God. They're serving themselves and their, their own gain. And here's the last thing that I want to say about watching out. So we're watching out for false teachers. We're watching out for fair speech. Watch out for... The simple ones. Watch out for them on their behalf. For the simple. The division and the offenses. Look at the end of verse 18. He says, And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. You know who the simple are? The simple are the naive. The simple are those who just put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Someone that just gets saved. They haven't had a chance to grow and learn. They're naive. You know who the simple are? The simple are our children who are young and impressionable and learning and growing. They, they don't have all of the knowledge that they need to have. And they're, they're simple. We have to watch out. We have a responsibility to watch out for them and to protect them. You know who else the simple are? The uneducated. This is more of a, rebu a rebuke here, too, because I'm going to say there are a lot of believers who are uneducated, and it's not because you don't have the ability to learn. It's because you won't learn. It's people that don't grow in their faith. 
It's people that don't pick up God's word and open it up and study it for themselves. You can't just rely on a Sunday morning message to feed you enough. I, I do not have an, this is a great important part of our growth and our faith. But if all you're getting is fed from a pastor on a Sunday morning, you are missing out. You need to open up this book and learn it and study it for yourself. And if you don't, you are simple, you are naive, and you open yourself up to false truth. That can have devastating effects in you and your family and those around you. And by the way, it's working. I only mentioned just a few things. I'm just scratching the surface. But I came across some statistics this week that just blew my mind. Do you know that more than half, 56% of evangelicals, okay, that's people that profess to know Jesus as their Savior, believe that Jesus isn't the only way to God? 56% believe, like what I said earlier, that as long as you believe in a higher power, something bigger than yourself, you're going to be okay in the end. That's a lie. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. 43% believe that Jesus was a great teacher, but that he was not God. That is so deceptive. If he was not God, he could not have lived a sinless life. He could not have paid your sin debt. The penalty for sin was death. And if he was not God, he could not have been a sufficient sacrifice. And we would still be lost. And we would still be without hope. Jesus was man and he was God. And he's always been. And he is God. And he claimed to be God. 57% agreed with the statement that everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. Now that's, yeah, there's some of you laughing. Some of you older people are laughing too because you've lived a while and we know that. Listen, we aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. There's a major difference there. The Bible, Romans taught us that, man. Go back to Romans 1. Romans 3, there's none righteous. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. I mean, over and over again, we are depraved. We're broken. You're probably here this morning because you know that you're broken, And we know that we need a savior. And here's one of the most devastating to me. One out of every four people who claim to be a Christian, that's 25%, believe that scripture is not literally true. One out of every four believe that scripture is not literally true. It contains helpful accounts of ancient myths and some good moral teaching, but it is not literally true. I could not disagree more. This book is the truth. This book is the foundation of truth. And if you start picking and choosing, how do you know what's true and how do you not know what's true? And if there is no absolute truth, we're a big mess because the only chaos comes from the absence of truth. This book is the truth of God's word and I believe it from cover to cover and we have to believe it. We gotta soak it up and we gotta learn it and we gotta understand it. And here's the practical application that I just gotta give to our church this morning. Love truth, love truth. The division and the offenses are in opposition to the doctrine which you have learned. Paul just finished teaching Incredible Doctrine. I'm not going to review all of that, but do you understand that as a ministry with a Christian school with 750 students that are about to show up on our doorstep every single day out of the year, we get to teach our students basic life-changing truth from God's Word. We get to help them understand the answers to the biggest questions in life. Where did I come from? Who am I? Why am I here? How should I live? Where am I going? All of us ask those questions. Your kids are looking for the answers to those questions. And I'm thankful that we get to open up books like Romans and we get to say, hey, there's none righteous, no, not one. Yes, you are broken. Yes, we are sinners. But let me tell you that the wages of sin is death. Yes, because of your sin, there's a penalty that that needs to be paid. There's a payment. It's death. It's eternal separation from God. But let me tell you the good news. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what did Christ do? He died for us. Hey, you're a sinner and you're broken, but the good news is there's a God in heaven who loved you and he paid for your sins on the cross. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you can be saved. Hey, I brought some alphabet cards with me. I just wanted to show you all these this morning. We're going to learn our ABCs this morning, okay? Who wants to learn ABCs? Getting ready for school. No, listen, these cards go to our kindergarten students. And at the end of every year during our kindergarten graduation, they stand up with some of them and they talk about some of the things that they've learned in Bible class. And you know what? While they're learning their alphabet, they're learning the letter A. You know what they also get to learn at our school? 
All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. They get to learn B. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. How about those two? We're starting with the basic ABCs. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if you believe on the Lord Jesus, you can be saved. How about C? Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. How many of you are thankful for a lesson like that? Yeah, oh man, we're getting some clap in there. Kids, obey. You're going to learn that. How about letter D? I'm going to talk about this more in just a minute. Depart from evil and do good. Man, that's what Miss Bacon was just talking about, that God would give us, help their students to have the purity of mind, to depart from evil and do good. E, even a child is known by his doings. You have a reputation and a testimony that's starting to be built and developed at a young age. We get to teach the truth of God's word. Yes, we get to give an academic education. They're going to learn science. They're going to learn math. They, we got a brand new science lab this year that we're excited about being able to use. They're going to get an education, but more importantly, they're going to get the truth of God's word that can literally shape and change and develop their lives for them and for generations to come. That is something that we need to be passionate about, something we need to pray about. All right, I got to move on. That's a warning. Here's the promise. It's going to take me a minute to get to the promise. Okay, look at verse 19. He says in verse 19, he says, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. Man, Paul is proud at the church of Rome because you know why? They had a great reputation. Their obedience was known to all men. I mean, they were soaking up the truth of God's word. They were growing. They were learning. They were embracing everything that they had been learning. That's why the churches of Christ were saluting them. Paul's proud of them. I mean, you are what you should be. You're soaking up God's word and the truth. I think this is awesome. But Paul's also concerned for them. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I'm glad, therefore, on your behalf. But then he says two words. But yet... But I'm concerned. These false teachers are going to come in. So you've got a target on your back. And look what his solution is, everybody. This, you got to underline this. This is so simple, but so profound and life-changing. I like simple, but profound and life-changing. Look what he says at the end of that verse. But yet I would have you what? Wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. You know what his solution is? to the false teachers and to the fair speech. Obviously, you got to know the truth and the doctrines. But what he's saying is, I want you to be wise in being good and simple in being evil. So a couple applications here real quick. Be experts in good. The word for good means moral excellence or admirable. Be an expert at recognizing what is good, what is excellent, what is right. Know the difference between right and wrong. Here's a really simple way to say it. Be good at doing good. You know what God wants us to be as Christians? He wants us to be good at doing good. You know what you want for your kids as a parent? You want your children to be experts in good, to be good at being good, to recognize what is good, to want to embrace what is good, to put it in your life and let it affect your life and to change everything about your life. I love the fact that one of the pieces of the armor of God is the breastplate of righteousness. So I brought a modern day breastplate of righteousness. I was walking through the hallway. Uh-oh. Okay, well, good, we made it on. I was walking through the hallway with this earlier and someone's like, we got problems? <laughs> you worried about something today? And I'm like, I don't think so, I hope not, but now I feel better. So anyway, <laughs> might just start wearing this all the time. I love the fact that the Bible talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians 6, I don't have time to talk about it, but there's the armor of God that we get to put on in our lives. And if you're following Jesus and you're doing the right things, this is not, when I said it's simple, we need to be experts in being good. We need to be able to identify what's right and what's wrong, and we need to embrace what's right. Do you realize that when you do that, you're making yourself a whole lot safer and secure from the attacks of the enemy? I mean, let's just take some of the Ten Commandments real quick. Let's just talk about some of the Ten Commandments real fast. What's the first one? Anybody know the first of the Ten Commandments? I'll get you started. Thou shalt have, thou shalt have no other gods before me. How many of you agree that if you have no other gods before you, if you know the one and only true and living God, that's a good thing. That's going to provide some protection in your life. How about the second one? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. 
Don't worship idols. Don't love anything else in your life. Don't put anything else in your life equal with God. Keep God first above every other passion and desire. Don't bow down and worship anything but God. How many of you agree that's a good thing in your life? Then he says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Man, we could start looking at that one and saying, well, we shouldn't say, and I'm not even going to say it, but we shouldn't use the name of the Lord in vain. But I think it goes a whole lot deeper than that. We shouldn't just frivolously go around and say, I'm a Christian and I'm a believer, but we're never reading our Bible and we're never acting anything like a Christian. If you're not going to take the name of the Lord in vain, that means you're not going to have anybody that's equal to him in importance. You're going to have no other God before you. You are going to be setting yourself up for success in life. You're going to be protecting yourself with righteousness and the armor of God. Hey, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. How many of you believe it's important to go to church? But it's so much more than that. That whole command's about worship. That whole command is about resting in God and trusting in him. Man, when you rest in God and you trust in his might and in his power and you worship the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're protecting yourself. You already clapped at children obey your parents, so honor your father and your mother. That is a really important command for you kids. Just obey your parents, man. They can make life really simple for you just by doing the things that you know are right to do. Then you get into things like thou shalt not steal. How many of you believe thieve, being a thievery? is wrong. Guess what? Don't be cheating in school either. That's stealing too. There's lots of ways you can apply that. And then he says, thou shalt not kill. We all know that killing's wrong, but the New Testament goes further. Don't even, if you have hatred in your heart, it's the same as murder. But it goes even further. Don't just, we're supposed to be experts in good. We're not just supposed to be satisfied that, man, I haven't killed anybody, punched anybody. I did really good today. <laughs> some of you go home like that. I talked to some of you and you're like, I didn't kill anyone today. I had a good day. No, we're supposed to be experts in good. We're supposed to do good unto them. We're supposed to bless those that curse you and do good to those that despitefully use you. That's next level. That's hard. But if you're an expert in being good that way, you know what you're doing? You're protecting yourself with the breastplate of righteousness. I could go down through the other ones. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Man, the New Testament says, don't even look on a woman to lust after her. Thou shalt not covet. Be content with the things that you have. Stop looking around at others saying, I wish I had more and I wish I had this and being discontent in your life. Get up every day and count your blessings and get on your face and thank God for his goodness and the breastplate of righteousness will be around you and you'll be protected. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. You know what? I think this one is one of those areas we are really, really, really good at not lying, but stretching the truth, aren't we? And how many th times do we justify? When you lie, when you stretch the truth, it doesn't make you safer. It makes you more vulnerable because now you got to defend your stretching of the truth and you got to defend your lie. And it's just a web that gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Can I tell you that when we're experts in good and we say, I'm not even going to taint my life with a little bit of untruth. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be right. I'm going to be just in all of my doings. I'm going to be open and upfront. Do you understand the protection that you are putting on in your life? Mrs. Bacon was exactly right with what she's saying, that our students would be pure, that they would embrace the truth, that they would hear the truth and accept it for what it is and recognize the good blessings that come along with it. Be experts in good. And then he says, be simple and evil. So that's the second application. Be simple and evil. You know what that word simple means? It means pure. It means free of guilt and sin. We need to be untainted by evil. We need to be unmixed with evil. Do you understand that's simple? Be pure, be untainted, be unmixed with evil. Here's the problem. You know what many of us do? Let me see if I can get this off. Without messing up my hair. <laughs> and then I'm gonna get serious. And even if my hair is messed up, just pay attention, okay? So anyway, no, here's... Here's the thing. You know what we do? The problem is that so many of us believers, we do a really nice dance with evil. We do, a really we do a really nice dance with evil. Here's what I mean by this. We learn about evil. We watch evil. We laugh at evil. 
We allow ourselves to be around evil and all the time we're convinced that, well, as long as I'm not actually involved in the evil, I'm okay. This verse is saying, no, be simple when it comes to evil. Don't even be a beginner in evil. Draw the line when it comes to evil. Call it out for what it is. But you understand that as long as we're doing that little dance and we're watching it and we're playing with it, we're not experts in good. That breastplate of righteousness is not on me. And it's not going to be long as long as I'm dabbling with it before some of those things start landing. And some of those things start affecting my life. And some of those things start bringing consequences. And they start robbing us of the blessings of God. Can I tell you this morning that the Bible says draw the line. Stop watching evil. Stop laughing at evil. Stop putting yourself around evil. And take a stand and say, no, I want to do what is right with my life. Can I beg you and plead with you? There is a war that is being raged for the hearts and minds of our children. And evil and false teaching is all around them. And unless they buy the truth and sell it not, and unless they're willing to do what's right and to put on that breastplate of righteousness, they are open and they are vulnerable to an enemy that is powerful and to an enemy that is good. Would you please pray with all your might for our school that we would be a school where they see the truth and they buy the truth and they're wise and good and they're simple when it comes to evil and that our kids would draw some lines in their life and stay away from things that can wreck and ruin them. Now, you might be saying this whole point is supposed to be the promise. What's the promise? Here we go, and we're about done. Look at verse 20. He says, and the God of peace shall what? Bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Now, that bruise, it's not just a little black eye. He's not just going to give him a little punch, and Satan's going to have a black eye and lick his wounds for a while. No, that word is a powerful word. It means to crush to break one's opponent into small pieces. Do you understand that the God of peace is literally going to crush the enemy? You might think that that sounds contradictory. How could a God of peace also at the same time crush an enemy? Well, it has to be that way. You have to crush and defeat evil in order for there to be peace. And a holy, righteous God, the God of peace, that wants peace for all of us in our lives, will one day come and he is going to give a blow to the enemy and it's going to be over. So you want to know what the promise is this morning? Here's the promise. The promise is a blowout. All right, everybody say that out loud. What's the promise? It's a blowout. Do you understand? It's a blowout. It's not even close. Now, this is important for us to understand because too often in our lives, we act like Satan has the upper hand. And it almost feels more inevitable that we're going to lose instead of the fact that we're going to win. And by the way, there's a lot of good reason and evidence for that because Satan is a good enemy and he's powerful and he's deceptive and he is winning out in many hearts and many minds. But can I tell you that that cannot cause our faith to waver. We know how this is all going to turn out in the end. And one day God is going to crush Satan. And you know what he said in that verse? Under your feet. Under your feet, if you're saved and you're soaking up the truth and you're wise in what is good and you're simple in what is evil, you get to be a part of that victory march one day and you're at war and you're in the trenches and you're fighting every single day. And I pray for our teachers. That's what they're doing. They're praying and they're getting in the trenches and they're begging and pleading with our students to do what's right and to surrender their lives to God. And it feels like war because it is. But one day we're going to be a part of the ultimate victory. One day he's going to be crushed under all our feet. And we get to say, hey, greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. That's the promise that we need to live in. That's the promise that we need to hope in every single day of our lives. And you know what else is good? He says that that's going to happen shortly. That's a nice word right there. You know what shortly means? Shortly. (laughs) It means a rate that is rapid. Victory is coming rapidly. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I've been hearing that my entire life. And by the way, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus Christ died, and he still hasn't returned yet. And the victory still isn't here. Can I tell you that God is not limited by time and space? And he says that 1,000 years is as a day. So it's only been two days, folks. (laughs) And seriously, it's only been two days. 
God is also long-suffering in mercy. I'm thankful for his mercy. I'm thankful that as long as we have life and breath, there's still chances for people to repent and get their lives right with God. But make no mistake about it. Ultimate victory is coming. There's nothing that's standing in the way of the Lord's return. It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen at any moment. And we need to stand in faith, believing that God can use us to make a difference as long as we are still alive and as long as we are still here. So I want us to pray with that type of faith believing. We're not just asking God, yes, it is desperate and we need his help. But it's with faith believing that somebody's life is going to be changed. Somebody's heart is going to be changed. Somebody even here in our service this morning that's hearing this truth, your life can be changed and your heart can be changed because our God is victorious. And here's where we're done. Here's the prayer. Look at the end of verse 20. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what the grace of God is? It's his unmerited favor. It's God's goodness. Are you thankful that God is good? Are you thankful that his goodness and his mercy follows you all the days of your life? Can I tell you this morning that the prayer that, that Paul is praying for the church at Rome, who he's proud of because they're embracing the truth and they're soaking up the truth. He's saying, the God of grace, of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen. You know what he's telling them to do? He's telling them to live out the truth. The warning that we talked about this morning was to watch out. The promise was a blowout. But the prayer is to live out. Live out the grace of God. Live out God's goodness and his favor on your life. As you're wise in being what is good and as you're simple and evil, God's gonna bless your life and live out his goodness and live out his favor and live out his truth so that when other people see you, they want what you have. And can I tell you this morning, the prayer for West Florida Baptist Academy is that we would live out the truth of God's word, that other people would see the goodness and the grace and the favor of God on this school and on this place and that they would put their faith and trust in him and that their lives would be changed. Amen. And here's the truth that I want you to see. And I'm waiting for our, our instrumentalists. They can come at this time. But the Bible says, I mean, the prayers that I want us to pray this morning is pray for truth to be seen. Pray for truth to be seen. That's what Miss Bacon was asking about a little bit ago. That, that's just a simple way to put it. Pray for truth to be seen. Pray that we would be experts in good and simple and evil, that, that the kids would buy the truth. And if they're going to buy the truth, you know what we as parents and grandparents need to do? We need to buy the truth. So will you pray that his truth will be seen for what it is? It is good. It is God's grace. It's the way to God's favor and the way to God's blessings. Pray for the truth to be seen. And then pray for the truth to be received. As they see it, they'll receive it. As they see it, they'll receive it. Where's all of our teachers at? Just If you're a teacher here, would you just raise your hand real quick? Slip your hand up, okay. Hold, put them up high. All right, everybody look around you. There's teachers all around you, okay? Here's what I want you to do. You can come down to an altar, or I want you, if you're near one of those teachers, would you just go over there, just lean over with them? Would you take a minute and would you pray specifically for our teachers that God would empower them, that they would be able to live out the truth? And will you take a few minutes and will you pray for our school that God's truth will be seen? that his truth will be received. We get a front row spot, man. We're on the front lines of this battle. We get to teach the truth of God's word. We get to combat all of the air and the false doctrine and the things that could lead our kids astray. But we need God's help and we need God's blessing and we need God's power. So let's all stand to our feet. Maybe you could sit down in the seats with your teachers. The altar is open. Some of you, would you come down here and just, would we get on our knees and take a few minutes this morning and pray? We need God's help. And we can't be frivolous about this. We can't be light about this. We need God to step in and do what only he can do. So let's take a minute, bow our heads, and let's pray that God would bless.